Welcome to the Hamumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown, the podcast where we watch scary movies so you don't have to. From award-winning to completely unknown, we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hommel. And I'm your host, Solange Hommel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously as we take these movies seriously. Sully? Yep? Can you tell me what movie we watched today? Nope. Uh, I would really appreciate it if you would just tell me the movie name. Nope. So you're not going to tell me the name of the movie? Nope. This is a very difficult podcast to create, thanks to you. Nope. The movie was Nope from 2022. <laughs> what a comedic skit. You are very clever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are too. We're, we're fun. <laughs> I can't believe we finally got around to seeing Nope from 2022. I know. We've been talking about watching this movie since it wasn't even out yet. Yeah. Because Jordan Peele is one of our favorite writers slash directors these slash days. Slash funnies. Yes. Yes. He's hilarious himself. And he has done some like really great horror movies. Yes, he has. Has he done it again? Uh, are you asking me to review the movie already? <laughs> I mean, we, we are doing a movie review <laughs> podcast. Um, here's the thing. The movie that I clo- most closely compare this to for myself and my enjoyment of it is Signs, which I sort of uh-huh. feel like might not feel as complimentary as it could. Oh, yeah. But Signs was one of my favorite movies when it came out. It felt new and interesting. It was like just the right amount of scary to make me feel tension while I was watching it, but not so scary that you couldn't watch it with like just about anybody. Like it was a very accessible horror movie. And I always liked the fact that there were all these little bits and pieces that didn't make sense until you knew all the pieces and then they all just clunk fell into place and they were perfect together and it was back in the day when m night Shyamalan was making movies that i liked and not (laughs) movies that made me think he had some kind of brain disorder yeah so i mean that as an extreme compliment when i say that nope very much reminds me of signs well if you want to give out extreme compliments i wrote in my notes that Jordan Peele is like Stephen King, where he sucks you in with these characters, Mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, that's such a character. You know, it's not just a person who's just fulfilling a role. It's like, oh, that's a character with a whole personality, and I'm intrigued by what they're up to. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole lot of that happening. And all of those character interactions, too. Like, you have Mm -hmm. the dad, you have uh, Otis, you have OJ, his son, you have Emerald, M the daughter like and they all have their own things they're all these very unique people but then they also have like these little realistic quirks between them you know there's an actual father-son relationship there where the dad is like vaguely disappointed Mm -hmm. because the son hasn't lived up to his expectations and the son is frustrated because he can't possibly live up to his father's expectations and you know there's just like Interesting family things. And then there's an insane guy who works at Fry's. Right. Then there's just the weird guy from Fry's who (laughs) follows you home and won't leave. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It just, it felt very real. Even the fact that it was like Fry's. I don't know. Like that felt like a very significant choice to me for some reason. Partly because it was the aliens Fry's. Mm. Because Fry's, if I'm remembering correctly, is the like tech store that every store had a like a different theme right yep so the fries in la is the one that has the alien like the ufo crashed outside the front of it and whatever is it i mean i guess it must be we saw them walking into it and that was what that was when i noticed i was like (laughs) oh this is the alien themed fries yeah which felt like 
very appropriate. But also just something about it being a fries. It's like walking into a Best Buy. Like, mm-hmm. like it's just so human. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to explain it's it. Its design is very human, right? It's like, like walking into a, an Apple store doesn't feel as every man as yeah. walking into a Best Buy or a Fry's. That's definitely true. And Fry's even more so because I kind of think of them. I don't even know if they still exist because I think I of know. them as like. Like blockbuster video, you know, like <laughs> yeah. they used to exist. They used to be a big thing, but you don't really see them anymore. Well, they got a big boost from this movie. I guess. Because people found out just how <laughs> helpful they are and how they will sell, they will set everything up for you. They'll come back to your house every day to keep checking on it. <laughs> They'll monitor your video footage from their office, <laughs> whether you give them permission to do it or not. Yeah, even if you explicitly <laughs> tell them, no, don't do that. Yeah. No, it just felt it just felt very human. Like the whole thing felt very real, and I think that's I, I agree with you that that's very Stephen King. Yeah, and I think that's part of what I liked about you know why it made me think of Signs too, because Signs also feels like that to me. Like it feels like a very like these are just everyday people experiencing this. It's yeah. not the president or some scientist or whatever. I. I th- feel kind of the same thing I saw with signs, which is that there's these people have underlying issues and problems and that's all seeping through into what's happening. Like, I mean, it's basically just means they're full characters, but Mm -hmm. it's really noticeable. And you're like, what's going on? What's, what's this guy's problem? And you're, you're kind of piecing that together throughout the movie, even though it's not really the plot of the movie. It's just getting to know that character. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. But it did, you know, I think a lot of it does then, and this speaks to the skill of writing, a lot of those little everyday things that make them whole characters then come into play Mm -hmm. in the final culmination of the movie. Like, and not in like overt ways necessarily, not as overt as Signs. Signs was a little heavy handed in that. But I think... No. What? How could that be? But I, you know, there were just lots of things. There was like the sibling connection and the fact that Emerald knew how to ride a motorcycle, which was mentioned in an offhand way early on as part of her like hustle character Mm -hmm. because she's doing the thing for the business, but also promoting all her side stuff. And that was part of the tension between them. And then that becomes integral to them being able to defeat the monster at the end. I And I love that. I love when that happens. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, but that was, that was very relevant, certainly. Mm-hmm. The other piece that I think of um, is the, the big ceramic horse or whatever it's made out of that is kind of the symbol of the conflict between OJ trying to maintain his ranch and the amusement park run by Jupe and like how Jupe keeps wanting to buy him out and take over the space. And like this horse becomes the symbol of it. And like Emerald steals it at one point. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like in it, it plays a role in all these different parts of the story. And then also like is part of how they figure out how to defeat the monster. Like, it's just cool how all of these things go through but in a way that feels natural and authentic and not forced. So, tiny plot synopsis. The family lives in the valley in which there's a monster flying in the sky that looks like a UFO and sucks people up and eats them. So the way the movie kind of goes is, you know, it's a bit monster movie but then it sort of turns into, like I said a 1940s safari film basically like they uh, set up this whole plan to bring out the monster and get a good shot of it on film by using their buddy antlers who his willingness to be involved here was weird like it was it didn't seem like he would have actually done it well he he was he was definitely not doing it for them his life's mission was to get the impossible shot like he's a He's a film guy. He's a video, I don't know, videographer. I don't know what his name, what that title would be. But his whole mission in life is to get the impossible shot. Yeah. But just the fact that, I don't know, there's a lot in this movie where I have trouble following it. Like, I totally understand the plot. 
And I understand the people's motivations. I'm not sure what's missing there, but there's a part I don't understand. And part of it was like Emerald calls him up and is like, hey, there's, I mean, she's really vague about it, but she's like, basically, there's a monster in my valley and it would be, you know, I've got a job for you. Come film it. Like, what fancy oh. movie guy is going to be like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. But see, I think that was her being, that was her doing her hustle thing. Like, she's yeah. like, what can it hurt? I'm going to ask the most famous film guy yeah. to come and do a documentary of this monster so that we can get rich and put it on Oprah. Like, I think that was just her doing her thing. And he was like, nah, yeah, I'm not, not interested in that. <laughs> But then it got on the news mm -hmm. that people were disappearing and it became a thing. And he's like, oh, now, now it appeals to his motivation. And I think that's the cool thing is that all of the characters have their own reason for doing the things that they're doing. Yeah. It's not because the story says they have to. They are all driven by these deep internal things. And it just happens to be like... What happens if this set of people with this <laughs> set of internal drives experience this thing together? Yeah. And that's the interesting thing is how it kind of the climax of the movie is this. I've seen it in other movies, but it's not a common thing. It's this idea that there's this big monster out there and we are going to not defeat it, but we're going to lure it out and of carefully avoid getting ourselves killed doing so. And so they, you know, it's like a heist movie kind of. Mm -hmm. They develop a multi-part plan where they're all going to work together to get it out there and get a good shot of it so they mm -hmm. can sell it on Oprah, just like in every other movie. <laughs> right. Well, so I thought it was fun that at the end, too, they all have different outcomes that they're hoping for. Yeah. Like, OJ and M, their primary outcome is, I don't want my sibling to die. Yeah. Angel, the fries guy, I think was just like, I want these two to be my friends. <laughs> Maybe. Like, I think his motivation the whole time was like, I just want to make these new two buddies. I want to hang out with these two. They're cool. Could be. <laughs> Maybe Emerald's kind of hot and I want to get with her. That's possible. But I don't think it was just that. I think it was just like, I, I wish I had some friends. These two will do. Like, these will make yeah. good friends. I mean, there was something to him about, you know being into aliens and being like, ooh, I've got to find out more yeah. about these aliens. Yeah. But like, oh, here are some people who who are into the same thing yeah. I'm into. Like, he just wanted to geek out with other people who geek out about the things he geeks out about. Then Antlers was so driven by his need to get the shot that he didn't, like, that overrode all sense of safety and, mm -hmm. like, need to survive. Yeah, he was if, a very mysterious character who was just honed in on his one thing yes and in fact he was like if the shot survives past me that's the ultimate goal like he didn't care that he was gonna die if it mm -hmm. meant that he might get the impossible and i think for him the impossible shot was from the inside of this creature oh was that the intent well that was like because he's like, come and get me. I'm like, what? Yeah. I don't understand what's happening. And then when he got sucked in, I was like, oh, he's getting an impossible shot. And possibly knows that his camera will get spit out. Maybe. And like, he will have recorded something that no one else can record. Hmm. I don't know. That is interesting. I don't, I didn't notice that. And it, it makes sense with the whole idea. Like, there was a the whole thing. It was funny because they definitely got really good footage of this creature. And then Antlers looks up at the sky and goes like, oh, it's about to be magic hour. We're not done. I have to get right. th this really quality shot. And I was just like, that's just stupid. That has no scientific merit. It's just purely visual. It's not that important, dude. CGI it. And that might be more realistically what was happening, where it's like it was kind yeah. of a jab at like all of the <laughs> yeah. the visual architects of movies who are like, yeah, well, we got it, but if we wait five minutes and do it again, <laughs> we'll get a better version of it. Yes. And you know, that might be a joke, but I don't know. I kind of like the idea that he was like, okay, well, I got that, so that shot shot wasn't impossible. 
can I try for something even more spectacular? It, that makes sense because he was depicted as like very obsessed. And the sad thing for him is that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I mean, he did in a sense. He did. There, he did help them get the impossible shot, whatever. But what he was, what what I think he was going for, didn't happen. Yeah. In the end, Emerald had to actually get an impossible shot. Yes, and it was an impossible shot because it, it entirely relied on the timing just happening. Like there was no, and there the was wind very little blowing control. the right direction. Yes, yeah. there was very little control that she had over that, and she ended up getting it with this like well camera. I don't even <laughs> yes. know what that thing is. <laughs> That's hard to describe, but yeah, it was like a novelty camera at the park where you lean over the well and they crank it and it'll take your picture from looking, inside yeah, yeah looking down into the well but yeah it's a crank like it's not just a button like you could easily time it it was like yeah. a like a jack in the box where you like crank <laughs> it and then it pops at a certain point yeah which i think she had figured out when it happened but it added to the randomness of it where i was like i does she know is it the same every time do you just crank until or you know i don't know it was yeah. funny so at the end of this film mm -hmm. there's an issue and you brought this up yesterday and i said i'm not going to talk about that because we're not recording our podcast that's what happened okay which I remember is... you saying you weren't going to talk about it, but I don't remember what the thing was. Well, this monster looks like a UFO. Like that's that's the whole thing is you're like, oh, a UFO, but it turns out it's like a, it's more like a sand dollar that <laughs> sucks people up. What it really looks like to me, you know, in in X Files, how Mulder has that "I want to believe" poster on his yeah. office wall, where it's like the hill, you know, sort of like the C California Valley, blue sky cloud ufo coming out of it yeah that i feel like that was an inspiration piece probably because it's, it's just a very classic ufo yeah but it turns out it's actually an animal and at the end of the movie for no apparent reason it like transforms it opens up into because it's kind of like a radio controlled airplane you know is made of wooden ribs with like plastic sheeting kind of heat sealed around it mm -hmm. it's like that where it's it's got yeah, a structure kind of, but it's got when it when it went really fast you could yeah. see it like rippling in the wind yeah so it has this like cloth around it basically mm -hmm. and at the end of the movie it opens up and unfurls all over the place and it it's all like a weird. whaling ship <laughs> yeah it's got sails and stuff and the movie offers no explanation for that or for really anything, which is one of the interesting parts about it mm -hmm. is you're just left to wonder what, what all this is. And here's a thing that I had a thought about. I don't know what it means, but when it was looking at things, it would make this square. Like, a, yeah, it like pulsed. It had fringes. It yeah, was it clearly was... an organ of some kind yeah. for observational purposes yeah, and i think it could eat people that way or maybe i don't know i think it wanted to eat the uh giant inflatable cowboy that way mm -hmm. but it, that was its way of looking when it was unfurled at least and that was very reminiscent of a camera a big square shape looking at you and i think that's a lot there's a lot of hollywood in this movie i wonder if it looks like what it looks like to have a camera looking at you i think it probably does because i don't i always think of it as being round but i wonder if you see like well they have those like those hoods around you know uh -huh, big, big hollywood uh -huh. cameras that are square interesting so that's I hadn't thought about that i mean that's just a lot of this movie the fact that it's set in la and everything it's all very aimed at Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably some message in there about movie making. I mean, and a lot of the conflict in it is, you know, at the beginning, um, you know, there's the whole thing about is OJ going to be able to sufficiently wrangle the animals to keep this animal wrangling mm -hmm. business in, in a place where like they don't have respect for the animals. Like the, you know, he's, he's telling them this animal needs a break yeah. and they're like, no, no, we just don't want to get this one more shot. And then of course things go bad. And you know, they're like, well, how could, why couldn't you keep them under control? Like the whole idea of animals having their own drive and needs and desires and all of that combined with then they are trying to 
be the ones who find who who get the shot first so that they're the ones that profit off of it while they're competing with you know like TMZ and all yes, the other TMZ shows up um which was interesting because TMZ shows up and is only a guy in a like shiny yeah. motorcycle riding suit and you never see his face and he is obsessed with getting the shot even as he's dying yeah that was very <laughs> that was very pointed. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, so uh, that's I, I like this point that you're making about it possibly having to do with what it looks like to have a camera staring at you, trying to eat your soul. I don't, you know, there's <laughs> yeah. a whole lot of symbolism that could be going on there. The other thing I was thinking of is just in terms of like biology, like the idea of, if this is a, a space alien, it may have evolved, um, like, you know, that that's its best way of capturing, I don't know, sun, how <laughs> moving through space in some way, you know, like uh, I've seen other spaceship sort of things yeah. in sci-fi movies that Solar have. Solar sails. Yes. And so like it has, it has evolved that kind of outer space travel, but it also like, in Earth's atmosphere, it worked better to be this other shape. The other thing I thought of is a lot of animals, when they are threatened, make themselves as big as possible, yeah. right? And like this got much bigger. It looked more fragile to me, but it was yeah. so huge. But then it also used those fringes to like make snapping sounds, like yeah. flicking noises at, at him. And it made me think of a deer stomping on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not really that scary, but you're trying to look scary, except he was really scary. Yeah, and Kinda. that's the whole thing is that we just speculate on this because it's just sort of a it, – we're in the position of the characters where mm -hmm. it's just this is what it is. We don't know why. We don't know why it's here. We don't know why there's a magic cloud that doesn't move that it lives in. Yeah, it's somehow it controls there. that. Yeah. So all of this is just ignored. Like, it's – it's irrelevant to the plot, so yeah. it's just whatever you think it it's is. It's never explained why it takes out electricity. Like yeah. why within a certain or, or like right below alien. it or whatever. That's why. I mean that <laughs> it doesn't explain it and I'm okay with that, but it's obvious that they just needed some way of being like, We do know where it is even when we don't know where it is. Yeah. I mean that was just a whole element yeah. of the, the hunt. Okay, so we have barely at all talked about jupe and what his whole thing was because yeah. he was more than just the guy who wanted to buy their property to expand his uh amusement park yeah the whole i mean it's interesting because i feel like there's such an element of animals versus hollywood mm -hmm. like it's not just about hollywood it's about animal training and you know like this animal we can't train it we can't control it mm -hmm. But people still want it to do the right thing and be filmed while it's doing its thing. It's mm -hmm. very interesting. I don't know why that would be something someone would make a movie about, unless Jordan Peele was had his family killed by a monkey when he was a kid. <laughs> well, I'm, I imagine that, first of all, I imagine that there are lots of rumors about working with animals and animal... Tr it, um, animal actors going wrong. I bet. Whether yeah. they're real or not. I mean, I'm sure there are real stories, but like this whole, and I did not look, I wanted to look it up and I was oh. like, eh, that's more research than we do. This whole side story of the sitcom that has the chimpanzee as an actor mm -hmm. who snaps and like murders a bunch of the actor, his fellow actors, and then like eats the face off of somebody. And, <laughs> yeah. but then like fist bumps the kid who he yeah. likes like that feels like either something that actually happened which i feel like we would have heard that probably or some kind of hollywood lore based yeah. on maybe something bad that happened you know a chimpanzee like bit somebody or something that has then expanded into <laughs> this idea that this whole thing happened and then it was all covered up so nobody knows about it but it definitely happened and then jupe being the kid who the monkey liked and didn't eat Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if he liked him. He got shot before he had a chance to eat him, yeah. I guess, is, is well, I kind think, of how that worked. I think what happened was that there were no more balloons popping, so he was calming down, 
And he was kind of going around and going like, what's wrong, everybody? Why are you just uh, laying yeah. on the ground? And so he was coming over to see his friend. And then he fell back into his like training yeah. of like, okay, I'm, I'm no longer outside of my mind. Yeah. And now I'm going to do the thing I was trained to do, which is fist bump this little boy. <laughs> yeah. But so now Jupe is all grown up and he, rather than having it handled that trauma or addressed it in any way, he has a whole secret room full of memorabilia from this day when all of his coworkers got eaten by a chimpanzee. Yeah, and that's part of like the understated, figure it out for yourself, kind of just free nature of this movie is that he seems like he has it all together and he's just fine, but it's clear underneath that he has very deep trauma. He's mm-hmm. completely messed up mm-hmm. and it's just, it's just sort of unspoken, but it's in there. And again, that makes it feel very human. How mm-hmm. so many of us are like moving through the world, functioning in ways where most people wouldn't realize what was actually going on in our heads. And so then when somebody snaps or, you know, acts in a way that's, that, that the people around them don't understand, they're like, whoa, like that came out of nowhere. Yeah. When in fact it came out of somewhere very specific. And the same thing is true, like for the chimpanzee in the sitcom or for the horse that like kicked out when it wasn't supposed to, that OJ had trained. Like it wasn't that they behaved unexpectedly. It was that they reacted to something that all of the people around them didn't care about and was like, eh, this isn't important. This doesn't impact me. So why would it impact anybody else? Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel, I don't know, I guess where Jordan Peele falls under the whole, like, should animals be used in movies? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this movie was full of real life horses. It really was. <laughs> But I feel like he probably has some really strong feelings about it, and I'm not sure what they are (laughs) from this. But it would be interesting to have a conversation about that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing. is This is one of those kind of movies where, as I watch it, just from the very beginning, partly because of history with Jordan Peele, I'm going in looking for what does it mean? What's Mm -hmm. that symbolic of? Mm -hmm. What is that? Which is not how you watch an asylum movie. (laughs) And so I go through this whole thing and I'm like, I mean, is it really about animals being in movies? Like that's, it's possible. That's like something someone could care deeply about, but also is it all a metaphor for something else completely? And I don't know what it is. Well, okay. So now that you say that you think about, okay, the extension and we, I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago where I was like, Someday we're going to find out that animals oh. know way more than we think they know and yeah. they understand. And, you know, we've been doing really, really terrible things, which I am doubling down on given some of the things I've learned about orcas in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, they're getting mad. But if you take, if we take the starting point that the movie is saying of like animals have feelings that we don't understand and we can't just control them, we have to like, work with them because that was the whole idea of defeating the monster or or not getting eaten by the monster was that oj realized when you stared at it it took that as a threat you have to treat it the right way yes and so like if you if you start there you're like animals are so unpredictable and irrational but it's only because we're not paying attention and then expand that to the fact that people then say that about other people. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, you know, whether you're talking about men versus women or, um, you know, cultural clashes or race clashes or Mm -hmm. whatever, but there's, there's lots of instances where it could be one group of people looking at another group of people thinking that they are less intelligent, less capable, less, predictable less rational yeah and then you know the whole the whole underlying idea of really that stems from the fact that the on top i'm using (laughs) massive air quotes on top group is just not paying attention (laughs) yeah doesn't see all the signals and given like you said given that it's jordan peele i suspect there is like that is really what he was and so they just shoot the monkey without bothering to find out what it's up to exactly exactly yeah. And then you get to the end. Okay, now I get to the end and they just blew up the monster. 
they didn't know why that monster maybe yeah. that monster was lost it wasn't a monster at all that alien was lost yeah. it was scared it was alone on a planet maybe it was a child i we don't know and now it's dead yeah it exploded way to go oj no emerald emerald she did it but then where's the line too because that an that that animal that alien animal was going to kill them yeah and it was killing lots of people because it was feeding off of them. So it then is, so that many a, is that a bad thing? <laughs> Would it have been feeding off of so many people if Jupe hadn't been luring it there with the That's promise of people? That's a real good people? question. Yeah. Except he wasn't feeding it people. He was feeding it horses. Yeah. So maybe that was fine. And I don't know if he knew he was feeding it horses or if it... Because he, he was like... These aliens called the viewers like he thought they were. Which, by the way, this is all about movie Oh, my making. gosh. The viewers. Yeah. yeah. And the, the viewers, viewers are, just are just sucking you in and <laughs> destroying you. Yeah. yeah. And then they just want to stare at you with that square. Okay. What's super fun to me then is that he made this movie that then people are watching and... You know, doing like we're doing, critiquing <laughs> it, or, you know, thinking that they know things, or just even just... Yeah, to be clear, we don't think we know things. We do not think we know things. Just, like, using this movie for two hours of distraction from the hellscape that is the world, mm -hmm. and very few of them are realizing that this movie was basically accusing them of being monsters. Yeah, monsters that suck up Hollywood, suck up actors. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's Swallow a lot. Their souls. There's a lot going on there, and that's that's the thing. I love that, and I love when it's done where all of that stuff exists for us to play around in. A significant portion of it, I think, is very intentional. There might be things that we've added to it because of our own yeah. thinking, but I think a lot of it is intentional, and it's not over-explained because. Jordan Peele is like, I don't know, figure it out. Read a book. Yeah. There's a movie it really reminds me of. One of my favorites. I think I gave it a five plus. Okay. I at least gave it a five, which is Resolution, which has a similar, potentially has a similar idea behind it, where it's about the viewers mm -hmm. and how they interpret things and how they suck the souls out of the actors, in a way, if you want to look at it that way. So, uh, yeah, it, it has that same sort of thing. That's a great movie. That is a great movie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know. There was just, there was a lot going on here. And I said this earlier, but I want to reiterate one of the great things about it is that it, it really rides the line where it is definitely a horror movie. Mm hmm But it is a very accessible horror movie. Like, it's one that most, anyone who likes any kind of horror would be able to watch this. If you're really like the the Rob Zombie saw, you know, like <laughs> way out there kind of horror, this probably wouldn't do much for you. It would feel very mainstream. Yeah, it's, I mean... Because it only, is mainstream. Only a thousand gallons of blood are dumped on top of their house. Right? It's not that much. <laughs> um, but, you know, like it, it's mainstream. It was intentionally made so that a mass audience could watch it, which mm -hmm. makes that even funnier that it is then <laughs> making fun of audiences. Maybe. At some level. But you know it has to be it at has some to be. level. But what is it saying? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, I think, I think this is a movie that a lot of people could watch. Speaking of symbolism, the word nope, the title of the movie, comes up at very specific times. And if you notice, if you watch carefully, they say no in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. They'll say no, nah, -uh, no way. Like there's a lot of ways that they say no to each other. There were very specific times when they actually said the word no. Except I feel like one of them is OJ like seeing the monster come in and he's just like, nope. <laughs> which but is I just think the classic. It, it is the classic, but I also think like it ties into some of the experience. Yeah. And and so I could see that. My my take on it, and I could be totally wrong about this. But my take on it is that it all somehow plays into that theme of the hierarchy of who is in 
charge and who is not in charge within movie making. Mm -hmm. And, and I say it that way because like, I feel like most of them had something to do with perhaps the black experience in Hollywood. Yeah. The one that doesn't fit in that is the very first one or that I'm not sure how it fits in that is the very first one because it's like the catchphrase of the TV sitcom because which I mean, as you're, as we're seeing the opening credits and everything, like even like the, company logos like the movie hasn't even started yet and we're hearing the soundtrack of that day that the chimpanzee like went crazy and killed everybody and there's at some point i think one of the characters is like oh you would think that someone who was so smart could buy a better birthday gift and the dad goes nope and i was like oh this is gonna be a thing like we're gonna we're gonna hear this happen so i'm not sure how that one ties in but the next one Emerald is giving the safety spiel and she asks this like room full of Hollywood people, does anyone know which jockey rode the first movie horse? And of course nobody knows because it's not somebody whose name was recorded in history, regardless of how important it was because he was black. She asks that question, whoever it is, the director, whoever answers, nope, And it's so pointed. Like, it's Mm -hmm. so pointed. But then I think the other time, there might be times that I didn't write down, but there was the other time, I think it's the one that you were talking about, where OJ is in the eye of the storm and he's like looking up and he sees the alien and he's like, nope. (laughs) Yeah. And I wonder if that's, you know, if that's about like the black characters die first often. You know, or or are expendable, much like animals are in the movies. Um, to, I don't know, but I do feel like the times that Jordan Peele chooses to use the word "nope" are very intentional and have significant meaning. I don't know that I understand what that <laughs> meaning is, but it's there. Well, the idea, you know, that it's about how animals are used in filmmaking and then also that this is the family descended from the guy who was riding the horse in the very first Mm -hmm. bit of film who has is less memorable in the eyes of hollywood than the horse was right it's i mean it feels like it could be all about the black experience in Mm -hmm. filmmaking being lesser than and you know have to be corralled and Mm -hmm. told what to do. And so there, you know, that's a possibility. I, I do see on the internet, just one thing is that Jordan Peele has said this time he's being more surface level. He wrote it in a time when he was a bit worried about the future of cinema. So the first thing he knew is he wanted to create a spectacle, the great American UFO story, Hmm. but I don't buy that. I, I don't think he's capable of being truly surface. Like, yeah. maybe more surface, sure, I'll I'll buy that. But I don't think that he can write something that doesn't have layers to it, because I think that's how his brain works. Yeah, I think so, for sure. So, we don't know nothing about nothing, but there's definitely some stuff going on here. And it's, it's somewhere in that article, it said something about how... Jordan Peele makes movies and says, whatever you think it's about is what it's about, which is fine. But he's got some thoughts going on in there. Well, definitely. But I kind of like that he, you know, once he has created it, he's like, well, no, it's that's out of my hands. It is a conversation between creator and viewer. Yes. Yes. And that's always the most fun, I think, in watching a movie is when it feels like they have said important things to you, but then they also are like, now add yourself to it. Yeah. And I think that's the difference between this and Signs. Signs didn't feel like it was looking to me to add things to it. It was just like, (laughs) look at this clever thing I came up with. Yeah. Get it? Get it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. And and I mean that in a loving way, because that is one of my favorite movies. But I don't know. I don't know. But I did like how it was all mysterious at the beginning, and we pieced mm-hmm. things together. Ratings. 
I don't know that I need to spend a lot of extra time explaining my score because I feel like I've been pretty um, transparent in how I feel about this movie so far. I really, really enjoyed it. I found it very entertaining. In a think about this as much as you want, but only as much as you want kind of way. Like it didn't shove things into my brain for me to be sad about for days, but I definitely have lots of little things that I'm going to be puzzling over. And I will remember this movie because it gave me things to think about. I think it's fun that we came, that we watched this one so soon after watching no one gets out alive, because again, this is a monster that did not disappoint me. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, we're not looking at, you know, the alien from alien, it's nothing super, super elaborate, but I think yeah, that's part of what I liked about weirdly it. Weirdly simple. Yes. And it was it was unusual. It was unexpected, especially when it started getting all like f- saily and mm-hmm. wavy and woo-woo. Like, I did not think that was going to happen, and I enjoyed it. Like, it, it felt sort of like all the other characters felt real and whole. Like, it made it feel like a real whole thing that it yeah. had... More than one morphology. I don't know. Is (laughs) that the right word? Sure. So I like that. I like when the monsters, when they show me a monster and it's better than what I expected rather than just being disappointing. So that was kind of cool. I am going to give Nope five wacky waving inflatable tube men out of five. And I'm going to strongly suggest that people watch this movie. Uh, It was, it was good. It was fun. It was enjoyable. It was well put together, and it will make you think, but only as much as you want to. Only as much as you want to. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, We have not discussed the cinematography of this film. Mm. The whole movie, for the most part, almost entirely, takes place in this California Valley Mm -hmm. where it's huge. I would be surprised if there wasn't an IMAX version of this movie, because... Everything you see is giant vistas Mm -hmm. of, you know, desert scrub and all that stuff and mountains and clouds. And it's big views and just everything. So I don't know, like you're already kind of thinking deep thoughts because you're looking at these grand Mm. landscapes kind Mm -hmm. of, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's priming you to be thinking. And it's very artistically done. Surprise. There's something about that because we just watched the first episode of Severance and I noticed in that that there's a, you know, one of these shots where the main character is walking into the building for the first time and it does one of those drone shots where the drone just keeps going back further and further and it gets more and more expansive. And I think that those are shots that are happening more because now we have this technology, like this drone technology makes it so easy to, to make these like sweeping vista pictures for people yeah okay so (laughs) you were saying that that is a thing yeah so on top of all the story stuff there's just the the look of it all is very impressive like it's not just good it's like wow Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i would say i mean all put together like it doesn't get boring or anything it's pretty much a perfect movie and like i always am with jordan peele i'm torn between five and five plus Mm. because does it you know like does it click with me and do something amazing for my brain like resolution did i'm not sure mainly because i'm not quite sure what it was about you know uh, Mm -hmm. beneath the surface but i would highly recommend people see it because it's wonderful it's just real good. You go and you have a good time and you see a monster movie. You see people getting chewed up by hot air balloons. Very strange. So just because you didn't give it a 5+, plus, I'm going to, for the first time ever, be the one who does a 5+, plus instead of you. Oh my gosh. That'll be fun. What if I change mine to be You can't. Plus? If you change it, I'm changing now. <laughs> no, I'm not going to change. I, I, I don't feel that... It's not that I don't think it deserves a 5+, plus. But there are some movies that I'm just like, five can't contain how I right. feel. That's what, yeah. And I didn't quite get that feeling. And that's the, that's the line I ride with Jordan Peele movies. Mm-hmm. It's always tricky. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I think I gave Get Out a five and everyone else was dying over it. But there was something about the the actual events of the plot in that movie felt kind of pedestrian to me. Like, it just was real straightforward going through, even mm-hmm. though obviously there was a lot of depth to what it all meant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in this movie, I don't feel that. I feel like the story is, did a whole lot. Which is ironic great. that he's like, this is my simpler version. <laughs> yeah. This is what I do when I'm not really trying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't know, guys. But I'm going to give this. I just this... woke up this good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to give this five plus wacky waving inflatable tube men out of five. Just because I can't see anything wrong with it. And even to the point where I think... It would be a rare person who wouldn't enjoy this movie. Like, it's great for everybody. Everyone should see it. Something I thought of while I was watching this movie, it was, I was like, it, like a third of the way into it. I'm like, oh, these characters are so interesting and I'm enjoying them. And it reminded me of when we went back and watched The Karate Kid many decades after it came out, like five or six years ago, something like that. We saw the Karate Kid, and in the opening scene, which is just him talking to his mom in the car, it's stupid, you know, Mm -hmm. it's nothing special, I was immediately enthralled Mm -hmm. because of the characterization and the acting. And Mm -hmm. it was like that, where I'm just like, this is is cinema. Show me this, instead Mm -hmm. of stupid people reciting exposition. There's there's a very distinct skill to writing dialogue. Yeah. And and I think, and also acting dialogue you know like Mm -hmm. acting is a skill right (laughs) obviously but it's it's so easy for it to fall into the uncanny valley of like that sounds like the words people use but that's not how people would use them yeah and one of the things that i like best about jordan peele's writing is that that is not a problem he has he knows Mm -hmm. how to write how people communicate with one another which is super interesting to me and i don't know what is it what is the little thing that what what is the thing that those people who can write like that have that other people don't yeah because it just it just seems to happen and there's another way to go that's also entertaining you know like kevin smith movies or firefly where it's stylized and it's making the point and it's it's telling you the story in an interesting Aaron Sorkin. way. Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> yes, there, there. You don't have to be realistic, but so many people try to write realistic human interaction <laughs> they fail. and make you wonder if they've ever met another human <laughs> yeah, in their lives. Definitely. My thought, my guess on that is that the more observant and like empathetic you are, the more capable you are of then writing characters how those characters would actually be because then they feel like real people not like people puppets that you are speaking through yeah that's always the biggest problem yeah i know i'm going to edit this down but we are well over an hour into this discussion this is a long podcast there was a lot to say there always is when jordan peele phones it in (laughs) perhaps next week will be shorter Perhaps when we talk about next week, it will be shorter. Okay. Well, I will see you then. All right. I can't wait to see it. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thing I didn't notice. OJ ducks for cover inside the structure with walls made of wooden slats and a horse runs by, so it's like <gasps> zoetrope. Oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. See? Don't tell me you're trying to be surface, Mr. Peel.